Well, good morning, everyone, and if you're a guest, uh, we're so glad that you've joined us. Welcome to this worship service in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You know, this past week, if you've been following news headlines, there's much to, to think about and to pray about, you know, with the hurt and the pain that we've seen in Kenosha, Wisconsin, with the, the hurricane in the Gulf states, with school starting in a, in a very different way, and and both uh, political conventions happening and an election on the horizon. And so with, with all of that, I wanted just to, to pray for us as we start this service and enter into our time together to, to bring all of this before the Lord and um, just to fix our eyes on Him as we enter into this time. So would you pray with me? Father, we're reminded by the, the words of Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so, Father, we cling to those words this morning. Think of Hurricane Laura and the Gulf communities in Texas and Louisiana. Would help and resources that they need be provided? Would there be hope in the midst of the devastation? And Lord, we pray for the election on the horizon. We pray for wisdom and discernment, and we pray for your people we would continue to be a people who seek to act justly and to love mercy, to walk humbly with you, our God. We pray for school starting, for teachers, for parents, for students, for safety and health, for perseverance in these very different times, for continued development mentally and physically and socially. Would you sustain and guide and provide for teachers, parents, and students? And Lord, we pray for the community of Kenosha and just the conversation around racial justice, for peace, for understanding, for listening, for lament, for learning, for righteousness. God, you made us in your image and you redeemed us through Jesus, your son. We pray that you look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us, unite us in bonds of love, and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we cling to the promises of Psalm 121, Even in our confusion, in our pain, in our hurt, the Lord watches over us. The Lord is our shade at our right hand. And even when we don't feel wise and we lack discernment, we know, Lord, that you promise to watch over our coming and going, both now and forevermore. We pray all this in the strong name of Christ. Amen. I invite you now to receive this call to worship. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels, and crown them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. everyone thank you once again for joining us as we sing and worship this morning I just want to invite you to and send a text right now to someone to say hey I can't hear you singing I can't see you but it's good to know that as we gather to worship I'm not doing this alone that we do it together
Let's worship our God and King is worthy of our praise. Sing all creatures. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us. is 
It's a word of hope. It's a word of hope we need. This is another song of hope. And we want to teach it to you. Um, the chorus is very simple. It's one word. It goes like this. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. I want to invite you to sing that with us, whether it's just you on your couch. Uh, whether you're sitting beside someone and you know it's not your thing to sing, you can give them a little elbow nudge and say, hey, I want to hear you. Here we go. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Stay close, my child, through this dark night. Rest in the shadow of these wings. Hope in the Lord whose day will The dawn of making all things new. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. that again. Stay close, my child. Stay close, my child, through this dark night. Rest. Rest in the shadow of these wings. Hope in the Lord who will see suffering and 
justice will roll the kingdom come. Love will arise, grace will uphold. Mercy will heal. Mercy will heal where the Lamb reigns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Rejoice, you sisters rejoice. Children of God, we are all coming home. Brothers rejoice, you sisters rejoice. Children of God, we are all coming home. Brothers rejoice, you sisters rejoice. Children of God, we are all coming home. Brothers rejoice. Sisters rejoice, all children of God, we are all coming. when I was a kid uh, when I'd go to sleep was my mom would come in and she would sing songs to me as I would go to sleep and that was 
was something about that was just comforting. And it was a tangible way of experience her of experiencing her presence, of experiencing her nearness. And we're gonna sing this one more time. You can sing along, or you can just hear our voices sung to you through your speakers and in faith just receive this as the presence of God close close to you Would you join me in reading the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trust in Jesus and to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise and to know the saith the Lord. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. Jesus.
save your friend And I know that thou art with me Wilt be with me till the Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So we spent these summer months looking at the letter to the Ephesians, and we've called this series In Christ. And we've seen how being in Christ changes how we see ourselves, how we see our neighbor. It changes how we think and how we act. And this morning, we're going to see how being in Christ changes how we think about marriage. That, that marriage in Christ is very different than a domineering kind of headship male headship, but it's also very different than a radical feminism. It's this third way. It's the Jesus way. It's not your life or mine, but it's my life being given up for yours. It's looking to the interest of your spouse first. And throughout this uh, message, I want us to have just this controlling image in our minds of Jesus on knee with a towel washing his disciples' feet. You know, it's in John 13 where Jesus surprises his followers that he gets on bended knee and he grabs a towel and he washes their feet and he shows them what kind of savior he is. And this image, I think, should shape our imagination, our praying imagination, our discipling imagination as we lean into marriage. That what kind of spouse would Jesus want me to be? And I think it is a spouse on bended knee with towel washing our spouse's feet. That marriage is a fight for the towel, not for the throne. That who's going to serve first? Who's going to lift the other first? Who is on bended knee? The late Christian author Henry Nouwen phrased it this way with a phrase, downward mobility. This is what Henry Nouwen writes, and I think it's a helpful image and picture for marriage. Nouwen says, the society in which we live suggests in countless ways that the way to go is up. But the way of Jesus is radically different. It is the way not of upward mobility, but of downward mobility. 
It is going to the bottom, staying behind the sets, and choosing the last place. Why is the way of Jesus worth choosing? Because it's the way to the kingdom, the way Jesus took, and the way that brings everlasting life. That marriage in Christ is downward mobility so that we can lift up our spouse. Again, it is the race for the towel, not a race to sit on the throne. And so with that in mind, I want us to just think through three questions. What is marriage? And then what does marriage require? And then what sustains a marriage? So first, this question, what is marriage? Now, marriage is a covenant. It's not a contract. It's a covenant. It's not a contract. Verse 31 from our text is helpful here. It's a passage from Genesis 2, 24, kind of the main marriage verse of the Old Testament, if you will. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And that word united is where we get this idea of covenant, that this deep, exclusive, legal, and kind of permanent binding together of two becoming one, united together. That in marriage, a declaration of present love is important. But to say, I love you now, is not the essence of a marriage, where we capture that in a contract. That marriage in Christ is a covenant. It's a future declaration of love that I will love you into the future. I'm bound to you. I'm united to you into the future, come what may. It's why we say things like this in our vows. No matter the valleys or the mountaintops, from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish for as long as we both shall live. It's a vow for as long as our lives shall last, and it's shorter than we think it is. And in Christ, there is enough strength and joy for the journey ahead. See, what is marriage? It is a covenant. It's a covenant made united. It's not a contract of a present love. And a covenant is so much more interesting than a contract. The famous poet W.H. Auden, he wrote these words. He said, like everything, which is not the involuntary result of fleeting emotion, but the creation of time and will, any marriage, he boldly declares, happy or unhappy, is infinitely more interesting than any romance, however passionate. That Auden is saying, a covenant is more meaningful than the rush of blood. That a covenant is more transformative than just a fleeting emotion. And I know this to be true in my marriage. I remember... The first time I held Kennerly's hand, I was so romantic. We were walking to a bookstore of all places. And we joke now, 13 years later into marriage, that when I first held her hand, I grabbed onto it too tight and was hurting her. Such a romantic into a bookstore. But, you know, 13 years later, when I reached down to hold her hand, there was so much more love and sacrifice and devotion and commitment. Yes, when I first held her hand. It was, it was this rush of blood and this fleeting emotion, but, but now there is so much behind holding her hand. It's covenant. It's that deep commitment. It's that union together built on 13 years of marriage. What is marriage? It's not a contract of present love. It's a covenant in Christ, united together, bound up together, And so if that's what marriage is, then the question is, what does marriage require? What does this covenant require to be united together? And it requires humility, not humiliation. See, I think oftentimes when we hear that word humility, we think it leads to humiliation, but following Jesus in marriage is a road to humility. That if each spouse is committed to humility in Christ and to building the other one up, I think then that covenant made together, that union together is solidified and strengthened. In verse 21, Paul writes, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There you see that picture of humility. Both genders made in the image of God, both genders equal before God, both genders called to rule and reign in creation, both genders, if you will, called to business and to parenting, to office work and to housework, 
mutually submitting together under Christ. Leading New Testament scholar Andrew Lincoln writes this about verse 21. He says, Paul's use of that reciprocal pronoun in verse 21, this idea of submitting one another or mutual submission in Christ, he says, indicates that it is not endorsing hierarchical social structures. So his point is that framing what Paul is going to say next about marriage with verse 21, this mutual submission in Christ, he's saying the foundation of marriage is not hierarchy. It's not a static relationship where one gender is above the other, one spouse is above the other. There is no hierarchies in marriage. We come together equal, united in Christ and before Christ. And yet Paul has much to say to the different spouses and different genders. We are equal before Christ. We mutually submit to Christ and yet the genders are not interchangeable. He says unique things to the husband and to the wife. Things that might, as this text was read before, be be difficult for us to hear and and create some dissonance. And why is that in the Bible? I don't want that to be in the Bible. Paul says to wives in verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as you do to the Lord. And we heard that word submit and we think it means this, 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 and this, and we just don't like it. But let's see if we can unpack that a little bit. What does that mean? What is Paul saying there? I think in a way he's saying this, wives, understand and support your husbands. Or later in the passage, Paul defines further what it means to submit in verse 33 when he says, respect, wives, respect your husbands. That a wife who follows Jesus is one who respects her husband and allows her husband to take the responsibility for her allows her husband to to start that responsibility, if you will, to fight for the towel, not the throne. That if the wife submits, then the husband is supposed to come underneath the wife and die to her. And it is not this static relationship. It is not a hierarchy where the husband is here and the wife is here, and that is the way it's supposed to be. That the wife submits to her husband, but then the husband dies to himself. And it is this ever-moving desire to, to get on bended knee and to fight for the towel. Paul goes on, why? why? Why do wives respect their husbands? Why do wives submit to their husbands? Well, verse 23, Paul says, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. And he goes on in verse 25 to say, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave him up for her. Now, let's take a step back, because these are actually radical words for Paul's time. In Paul's cultural context in Ephesus, the expectation here as Paul is explaining a household code is that Paul would say that husbands, you rule your wives. Husbands, you govern your wives. Your wives are a lower class. Husbands, you have exclusive authority. And Paul is doing none of that. And the Bible does none of that. If anything, headship here means a responsibility a responsibility to initiate this self-sacrificing love. Paul, again, in verse 33, defines headship when he says it is as if we look at the cross and we see the love of the cross, and that's the responsibility of headship. It's to initiate this cruciform way of life. It is not to stay in a static relationship and to be above your, your wife and to rule and to reign and to govern and to be in charge. Paul is saying none of that. It says the late British pastor John Stott said, headship means responsibility rather than authority. If anything, it means the responsibility to make sure that the husband leads by being on bended knee, grabbing the towel, and washing his wife's feet. That's what he means. And then the wife submits and she grabs the towel and the husband dies to himself and he grabs the towel. And again, it's this call to humility, not humiliation. Another word here or idea on husbands loving their wives. I think oftentimes we can, we can think that this love is just this heroic sort of life on the line. I, will, I would die for my spouse sort of love. And sure, it could mean that if that ever came into our lives, but for most of us, that's not gonna happen. Really, the call here is this everyday, ordinary sort of love. This everyday, ordinary, dying to self for the sake of my spouse, whether in work, 
or work in the home or kids or finances or whatever it might be. It is this commitment to be on bended knee and to race for the towel, not for the throne. Another word here which is interesting, you know, Paul is talking about you know, sacrifice and submission, but what is interesting is he gives no particulars on how this is supposed to work out in the home, which would make sense because this letter to the Ephesians first began with them, but it's a letter meant for, for every culture and every time. And cultures and times and couples do life different. And so it is this invitation for a couple to pray together and to work out what does this look like in our home? Because I think we can have this 1950s kind of leave it to beaver picture where the husband goes out and works and the wife stays at home and raises the kids. And that's what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 5, which Paul would have no idea what leave it to beaver is. Paul's imagination would be shaped by the Old Testament. It would be shaped by passages like Proverbs 31, where the woman is commended in that for her, her skill in business and in real estate. And so really what, what happens here, which a couple who's committed to submission and sacrifice and, and to racing to the towel, not to throne, and to humility, not humiliation, is, is to work it out, to understand the unique skills and gifts and desires and inclinations of, of each member in the relationship. That maybe one spouse works a little bit more so the other spouse can pursue education. Maybe one spouse takes care of kids if there's kids in the home so another spouse can progress in their vocation. Maybe one spouse likes yard work and the other one likes to cook more. Maybe one is better with finances. And these aren't gender-specific particularities. You pray and you work it out in your marriage. And if we're on bended knee with a towel in hand, seeking humility to serve our spouse, I think these things will work out. Again, in, in decision-making, I don't, I don't think this is a call, again, this picture of sacrifice and submission, that one, one part of the relationship has the trump card in decision-making. Again, I think, again, we're mutual submission in Christ. Both uh, spouses coming underneath Christ, in Christ, with humility, with towel in hand, praying and trying to work through hard decisions. And if a decision can't be made, step back and wait and pray. Seek advice from good counsel. But I don't see anywhere in here this trump card that one, one member of the relationship has the trump card in decision making because we're seeking humility and we're seeking the towel and we're seeking to serve. See, it's the call not to one upsmanship but to one downmanship. It's this reverse tug of war where I am desiring to lose for the sake of my spouse. It says that John the Baptist said about Jesus, he must increase, I must decrease. What if we brought that into our marriages? It's a, it's a spouse who seeks humility, not their way. That's what a marriage requires. Humility, not humiliation. And a marriage is a covenant, it's not a contract. But finally, what sustains a marriage? And what sustains a marriage is redemptive love, not romantic love. Now, romantic love is important, and it's the spark that initiates a relationship, but romantic love will not sustain a marriage in the long haul. Redemptive love will. Redemptive love found in Christ. Because here's the thing, and if you've been married for a while, or even for a short time, you know this marriage will challenge you, and marriage will stretch you. Let me use this image. Imagine that there's a bridge. It's an, it's an older bridge, and it's, there's a stream going underneath it. And that bridge has some structural defects in it. Now, you can't see it with the naked eye, but there's some hairline fractures in that, that bridge. It looks fine, but there's, there's some defects in it. Now, if you were to take a 10-ton truck and drive it on that bridge and park it on that bridge, what's going to happen where those hairline fractures are going to open up and the stress of that truck is going to make those fractures visible to the naked eye. I think that's what marriage does to us. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but all of us, we have these defects and we're not who we're supposed to be and that's why we long for Christ in our lives. But if you drive a 10-ton truck over our lives, if, if you enter into that covenant of marriage, it's going to expose those places, those selfish places, those greedy places in our hearts. And we're going to realize 
that we're more sinful than we ever thought. And we're in need of Jesus' grace more than we realized. And so is our spouse. And if we're banking everything on romantic love, and those fractures open up, romantic love won't be enough. See, if we're making romantic love and the love that we have for our spouse our everything, what happens when we get to a rough patch? What happens if we get criticized or there's difficulty or there's conflict? We'll see marriage just as a contract. And we'll look for chemistry somewhere else and we'll look for that romantic spark somewhere else because we're seeing that as our everything. But if we see the redemptive love found in Christ as our everything, and if we see the love that comes from Christ as more important than our spouse, though the love we have for our spouse is so important, but if Christ is more important and we drink deep from the well of his love, then we can love our spouse boldly, even if that romantic love is in short supply. We can love our spouse even if we're not experiencing that love back because we know, we know we're basing everything on the redemptive love of Christ, and he is what sustains a marriage. Author Dallas Willard, he put it this way. He said, we can afford to be compassionate only if we know there's an abundant compassion for us, toward us, by persons who have appropriate means. And he says, this is primarily God. We love because he first loved us. So our experience of God's love is what allows us, empowers us to set aside anger and selfishness, and lusting, and so on in our relationships to others, and maybe specifically to our spouses. We are loved in Christ, and from that love and the overflow of that love, we can then love our spouse. Romantic love is an important. It's the spark that initiates relationships, but it's the redemptive love found in Christ. And finding our identity in that love then allows us to love our spouse to the end. Maybe a word for those maybe who aren't married right now. I think there's still something for you here. Maybe you're in friendships or you have uh, in your family marriages that you love and you care about. And as you think about these words uh, from Paul, maybe you can speak truth into those marriages and you can love those marriages in this way and point them to this sort of marriage found in Christ. Maybe someday down the road you will get married. How much better to be shaped and molded in this way now for the sake of your marriage to come. But ultimately, I think the most important thing, whether we're married or we're single, is we realize that our identity is not ultimately found in marriage. That we are a whole, complete person, whether married or single. Because Paul, who wrote these words, was single. And Jesus, the one we follow, the perfect human being, was single, that we are whole and complete in Christ because redemptive love is what defines us, not romantic love. You know, my, my father-in-law, he tells the story when he was a pastor at a church in Denver, Cherry Creek Presbyterian Church. He was a, a pastor there over 20 years ago. And in Cherry Creek Presbyterian Church, there's this 12-foot wooden cross that is in the sanctuary, and it's, it's just off to the side of the pulpit, he tells the story when he was the pastor there that a couple came to him who wanted to get married in the church, but they asked if the cross could be removed for their marriage, uh, for their wedding ceremony, because they felt like it was so religious and they didn't want it to show up in their pictures. And he was happy to tell them that actually we can't remove the cross. The cross is permanent. It's part of the building. And that story has always stuck with me. A marriage that is a covenant. The marriage that is in Christ has a cross at the center of it that is permanent and that cannot be removed. And when you have the cross as a permanent center of your marriage, it can sustain you through the valleys, through the hard times, through the diagnoses, through the selfishness and the greed and the disappointments. Because we know that what sustains our marriage is the love that Christ has for us. Because Christ is the perfect spouse. Think about Jesus. We are made in his image. He made us to be in loving relationship with us. And we turned away from him. And what did Jesus, the perfect spouse, do in that? 
Did he turn our, his back on us? Did he say, I want a different spouse, a better spouse? I didn't sign up for this sort of marriage. No. He left the glory and wonder of heaven and he came to earth and he embodied flesh and he went to the cross and on the cross he didn't leave but he stayed. He stayed until the end through death and through resurrection. He is the perfect spouse. And we look to that redemptive love for us and then we hear these other words from Paul when he writes to the church in Philippians, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So we look at Christ, the perfect spouse who stayed and didn't turn his back on us, and we have that picture in mind. We have the picture of Jesus on knee with towel in hand, and we take those images, and we take the power of those images. We have the mindset of Christ, And then we enter into our marriages and we race not for the throne, but for the towel. It's not your life for mine, it's my life for yours. It's looking to the interest of your spouse above your own, just like Jesus did for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the redemptive love that defines all of us and is our identity, that we are whole and complete because of the love you have for us. And we can take that love and we bring it into our marriages. Lord, would you you do that? Would you fill us up with your love for us? And then would you allow us and free us up to boldly love our spouses, to pursue humility pursue mutual submission, to pursue covenant, not a contract, faithfulness to the end, to fight for the towel, not the throne, to be on bended knee, to submit and to sacrifice for the sake of lifting up our spouse. Holy Spirit, would you bless the marriages in our church, strengthen them, fortify them, fill them up, with your grace and mercy. We pray all this in the strong name of Christ. Amen. Your eyes are on the lowly, though others look away. Your feet run to the broken, your hands are quick to save. Make us like you, Lord. You walk with the forgotten and offer them a home, adopting the unwanted and calling them your own.
the glory of the Savior, let justice flow. Let justice flow like a river in the desert. Let the nations know that you will reign forever. Receive now the Lord's benediction from number six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So go now in your day in the name of the Father and the Son 